We preach in Christ Gospel Church is growing up in God and becoming like the Lord Jesus Christ so we can become His bride. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is preparing a bride. A lot of them will be in Christ Gospel Churches around the world. Not everybody in Christ Gospel Church is going to make the bride. That's what I've been trying to emphasize here with the Latin American Church, with the San Diego people, with the Sacramento people. It's a matter of a personal choice with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a matter of our turning our eyes towards Him and saying, Lord, don't let me miss it. Do everything in Your power, Lord, to help me make the bride. Yeah. And we saw last time how Ruth made that choice. Ruth made that decision. She did not take her eyes off of that Canaan's land and off of that land of bread and that land of praise where she would find a relationship with a bridegroom that she was just beginning to understand and just beginning to know. And it, we need to cry out and scream out to God to give us that vision, to keep that vision fresh within us. Because in these last days, the enemy is going to try to strip us of all hope, strip us of all of our vision, strip us of all of our get up and go. He's trying to, to push us back and move us down and, and, to, and to deaden us to the, to the thought that there is something more than what we have. He's, he's making all of the churches, the, the evangelical churches, go to sleep in these last days. He's, he's, he's making them fall asleep in these last days. And that reminds me, I've, I've got the tapes from Sacramento in English, but I didn't bring any with It didn't dawn on me. But uh, I've got the four tapes if you all want to sign up and I'll get them to you some way. Because we were talking there about how he's making us go to sleep. Yeah. Talking about the virgins that went to sleep. Yeah. And, and we've, got to, we've got to shake ourselves awake to move on and to push on. And, and the, in the Word of God it says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Amen. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Yeah. And what is this truth? The truth of the Word of God. The truth of, of what God wants of us to make us into that bride that His Word tells us about. Yeah. And we've been, we've been talking a lot about being a doer of the Word yes. in all of the places that I've been going. We, we hear about it. We go to conventions. We shout and we jump and we, and we run and we, we do everything within our power to, because of the power and the glory and the exaltation of the vision that comes to us. Yes. But having a vision and knowing that there's a goal, knowing that there's a prize, is not all that is the crucified way. We have got to become a doer to be able to reach that goal out there. Because I can stand here and shout and glory to God and hallelujah and the bride until, until the Lord comes. But if I'm not acting on the things that I know to act on, if I'm not moving on the things that I know to move on, if I'm not changing the things that I know need to be changed through the power of Jesus and through the power of His name, then I'm just standing here shouting and I'm not moving any place except in one spot up and down. Yes. But I'm not advancing. I'm not progressing. Yes. I'm not moving on. I'm not maturing. Yes, and we need to mature in this, in this crucified way. Amen. Paul, we, Paul said that we be no longer children. Yes. But that we reach out towards that prize that's set before us. That we be no longer children. And he was talking to a church that had all the gifts, that had all of the foundation laid, that had everything that, 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 that could be in a, in a church of the, of the power and the glory and the Word. And, and Paul, as is, is, is the preacher there, they had lack of nothing except they were children. And as a, ch as a child, we have to eat and we have to grow. Amen. And we have to come through a maturity in Jesus Christ Hallelujah. that does not come just because I saw the way. Right. Just because I, hey, there's a bride out there. Okay, I'm going to make it. Hallelujah. That doesn't get me to the bride. No. To get to the bride means I'm going to have to start moving. I'm going to have to start doing things that I have not done before and stop doing things that I have done before so that I can make that prize of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a living way. This is a real way. This is a going on for God way. And it's good to have a vision. But it's better to be trying to make that vision. It's good to have a vision. But it's better to be working towards reaching the goal. It's good to have a vision, but it's better to be digging down in your flesh and pulling out the things that are unlike Jesus Christ and absorbing more of His nature. That is better. And the best is yet to come when there's a union with the Lord Jesus. Hey! Hey! 
That's the best to get that love relationship with Jesus Christ. So you can choose today between good and better and best. Amen. Hallelujah. You can choose today. And I'm going to start showing you today with the Lord's will and by His grace a little bit of the better way. Um, we've talked about the vision. We've talked about what it has to be out there and to, to get it. The exaltation of the vision. But now let's put our feet down on the ground today. And let's understand a little bit about how we're going to make it. And I'm going to try and summarize today in a short time things that we've been talking about in the Latin American church, things we've been talking about in our teacher's classes, things that we've been, on Friday nights we have a leader's class in Spanish for the ones that are we're trying to send out to the different missions that are opening up. And remember to pray for that group and pray for those, those missions and those groups that are forming. Amen. And we've been talking about a lot of things there about headship and about uh, what God wants of us. So I'm going to try to pull together a lot of things and some of the last tapes of Sister Hicks, the teachings that, that are coming out recently from, from uh, Indiana. They have to do with basically the same thing. So if the Lord helps me, I want to leave a, a thought with you today that there's a better way than just having a vision. And the better way is up and moving and walking on to become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And God has given us everything that we have need of. All we have to do is avail ourselves of it. Use what He's given us so that we can move on. Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And starting in verse 24. Citrix has been teaching recently on the spiritual tabernacle but in a, in a very, very different way than what she taught years ago and from the book that she wrote years ago. She's going into a, a, a different level of it and it's tremendous, the tremendous teachings. And I'm just going to pull one thought out here for us. It says, Therefore, verse 24, Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. It's not just enough to hear. We've got to become a doer. Amen. Because a little bit farther down, Verse 26, it says, And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not. So you can be a doer of them, or you can be a doer not of them. And still be a hearer. Everybody I preach to, everybody Sister Dalton preaches to, everybody you, you all witness to, hear the Word of God. Hear the will of God. But how many of us are walking in the better way than just having a vision of what it means and we are, we are looking to become doers of the Word of God that's going to change. It's going to change this old nature of ours. So Jesus said, Whosoever heareth these sayings and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Hallelujah. And we know that this rock is Christ. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4 it says, And that rock which followed them was Christ. Hallelujah. And Christ is the living word. Christ is the person one of the one of the one of the part one of the parts one of the realms one of the one of the persons of the Godhead. Yes. There's the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Yes. He's a living Word. Amen. He's not a dead letter Word. Okay. He's a living Christ yes. that wants to come and live inside of us. Yes. And in one of the other classes, we saw that our hope of glory is Christ in us. Yes. And we've got to get His nature inside of us. That's what we're going to talk about today. But here it says that the rock is going to be really a foundation for us. Yes. And more than a foundation for us, it's going to be the cause and the effect of everything within our lives. In other words, God wants His Son, Jesus Christ, to become the head over all things in our lives. He wants us to plant our feet on this rock. And He wants this rock to become our head, to become our governing, our governing body, to become our, the governor of our life. The Word of God says that a woman should be in subjection to her husband and the husband in subjection to Christ. Amen. And all of us in Christ Jesus are neither male nor female. And in Christ Jesus, every one of us directly come under that headship of Christ. Amen. Whether we have a husband or not. Because Christ is the head. Amen. And in, in, in John 17, 17, it says, Sanctify them in thy word. Thy word is 
truth. Amen. Sanctify them in thy word, and thy word is truth. And if Christ is the rock, and the rock is truth, yes. then it means to sanctify us in Christ Jesus. Amen. It means to sanctify us in this rock. Yes. It means to sanctify us that, that we might have more of this rock and more of this truth within us. Hallelujah. 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 And Sister Hicks taught recently that this word truth is emet in, in Hebrew. E-M-E-T. Emet. <clears throat> and emet in Hebrew means restraint. Restraint. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. You shall know restraint, and restraint will set you free. Our hope of glory is Christ in us. Our hope of glory is the truth in us. Our hope of glory is restraint in us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our hope of glory. Our being set free does not depend on us just just letting go of the the reins of our life and just going and doing whatever we want, whenever we want. We're not going to have the peace, the joy, the love that all that Jesus Christ has for us if we are not restrained in our inner being. We must find these reins of restraint. Parents teach teach restraint to their children so that when their children grow up, they're good they're good citizens. They're they're good mature people. And they, and if you have children and you're not doing it, you need to do it because otherwise they're not going to be the children that you are hoping that they will be when they're 20 and 25 years old. And the same with us. God wants us to grow up and be mature in our way of thinking and acting and feeling. But the only way He can do it is by putting restraints on us. You don't let a little child play with a knife. You don't let a little child out here on the, on the curb run back and forth across the street. You don't let a little child in your medicine cabinet to play with the bottles of medicine. You don't let a little child play with the, with the paper bags that you bring back from the store. You don't let a little, a little child jump on the sofa and, 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 and color on the walls. If you do, <laughs> you're going to be in trouble with God and a lot of other people. <laughs> you put restrictions around them. You put restraint around them because you know that outside of that fence of restraint there's danger. Hey! Outside of that, that, that fence of restraint there's something that's going to hurt them. There's something that's going to do them harm. Or they, they themselves are going to be a danger to themselves outside of that fence where there's, where there's enemies within and without. So a good parent's going to put walls of restraint, do's and do nots around their children so their children will grow up healthy and strong and mature in their ways of thinking. Amen? And there's a Bible verse. Let's go there. If I can find it real quick. Hebrews chapter 12. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. I think it's chapter 12. Let me find it. In verse um, verse 6, Hebrews 12, verse 6, it says, For whom the Lord loveth, he, he what? He chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. How many of you want to be children of God? Then that means God's going to scourge you and God's going to chasten you. Because we are outside of the fence 99% of the time. We're outside of the restraint 99% of the time. But it's time now to jump back inside of that corral and let God start pulling in a lot of our passions and a lot of our ideas and a lot of our own doings so that we can be a a real child of God. Hallelujah. And it says, But if ye are without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. You want reverence from your children? You want respect from your children? Teach them then the correction of the Lord, and they will respect you. Correct them, and they will respect you. Spank them every now and then, and they will respect you. If you do it in love. Not if you do it in anger, but if you do it in love. Don't let them them go go roughshod any place, anywhere, anytime. 
put a, put a fence around them and they will reverence you Amen. because they will know that you're doing it out of love yes. for their good Hallelujah. and for God's glory. Amen. And it says here, Furthermore, we have fathers in our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much more rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? Amen. Paul saying here, if we could give reverence to our natural fathers when they corrected us, then shouldn't we much more give reverence and follow the correction of our Heavenly Father? Because He's not only going to correct us, but He's going to give us life. He's going to give us life with that correction. He's not going to give us death. He's not going to take away something and then just let us wilt away. If He takes something out of our life, He's going to put something of living, eternal value within us. And we will come up then with the the love, the joy, the peace, the mercy, the temperance, all of these things of the fruits of the Spirit that we do not have right now. Everything that we do in in our flesh makes us sad makes us unhappy, Amen. makes us discouraged. It, it might last for a, for a while, but it, after a while we're, we're down again. We're, we're, we're just the same again. Or we're angry at ourselves because we blew off over here one way or another. And, and nothing in the flesh is going to satisfy because all that's in the flesh is death. All that's in the flesh is sin. And it cannot give us life. But the correction of our Heavenly Father will give us life. Because the restraints of our Heavenly Father, the restraints of this rock in it in our life will take away the death of our will inside that is so unlike God. And in its place, He will put in life and eternal life that will not pass away, that will not ever change. And that life comes from the tree of life with all the fruits of the Spirit. We talk about and we dance about and we sing about but how many of them do we have working in our life? 24 hours a day. That's where the better road comes in. Because God wants to give us better, which are these fruits of the, of the Spirit of God. But there's another portion. Let's go to Romans. Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. It says, verse 1, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. Now look at verses 2 and 3. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she is married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress though she be married to another man. Deep, deep words. <laughs> but Paul isn't only talking here in the natural. Paul's talking in the spiritual. Amen? And what he's saying here, while we're married, while we're married to a, to a husband we cannot be married to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. While we're married to our first husband, we cannot be married to the Lord Jesus Christ. Our first husband has to die. Our first husband has to go to the grave. Amen. Our first husband has to be done away with. Yeah. Amen? Amen? So that we can find a marriage union with the Lord Jesus Christ. And although we have had a first husband, if he's dead, then we can be joined to the Lord Jesus Christ legally. 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 And this is what I've said so many times. Jesus Christ will not be married to somebody that's married to somebody else. Jesus Christ will not be joined to an adulteress. And the adulteress is that we are joined to our flesh. From the Garden of Eden, we took on a husband that's called the old man. We all have an old man. Even though I've been, never been married in the natural, I've got an old man hanging on to me that I've been dragging around for a long, long time. And it's my duty to get rid of the old man and take on a new man, the Lord Jesus Christ, within my soul. 
the old man that Paul's talking about here, the, 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 the first husband that he's talking about here is this old corrupt heart that we inherited from Adam the first. This old corrupt nature that we inherited from Adam the first. We have got to put him in the grave and cover him up. Hey! And then we can arise with resurrected life and get joined to the Lord Jesus Christ with a newness of life. With, a, with true life within us. But what we want to do is bring Jesus Christ down to our level instead of getting free. Free. The truth will set us free. And when that image, restriction, restraint, truth comes to us, then all of a sudden we will have wings. Hallelujah. And we can soar up and get a new joining with the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey! And we will be free indeed. Free indeed. Free indeed. Not free in thought. Not free just because I hope I might be. Not free just because the pastor told me I'm free today. Not free because, well, I better say it or else they're going to rebuke me for not having the victory. Uh Uh-uh. Really and truly free. Because our first husband is the one that's doing us harm. Our first husband is the one that's, 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 that's making us so unhappy in this world. That's pushing us and, and pulling us and, and putting us down and putting us in the dumps and putting us in the pit and, and doing everything, everything it can to discourage us to walk on in the way of the Lord. But Paul says here, there's hope for us. There's hope for us because this hope lies in the blood and the fire and the waters of the Lord Jesus Christ. They can undo the the power of this old husband within our souls and within our lives. The only thing we have to do is want to become widows. (laughs) Want to become widows. Want to become widows. And, and, and I hope if ever, anybody ever gets hold of this tape, they listen to the whole tape. <laughs> and not just part of it. <laughs> because it could sound very, very strange that I'm telling them to get rid of the old man. <laughs> Put him in the grave and get married to another. <laughs> this is the way some wild stories start about us in Crucified Way. <laughs> so if her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she is an adulteress. I don't want to be an adulteress. I want to be free. But the only way I'm going to be free is through restraint. When Jesus Christ comes and He puts His hand on me and He says, this is unlike me. I want you to get rid of this. I don't like the way you talked over here. I don't like the way you spoke over here. I don't like the way you treated that person over here. That is restraint. And that is good for us because it's the Father of Spirits giving us the correction that we have need of that we might get life. So... That we might find a life and life in abundance through the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Blessed be His holy name. We have a Father that wants us to grow up. We have a Father that wants us to be different. All we have to do is cooperate. When He puts the bridle in our mouth, when He puts that saddle on us, and He wants to take a trip with us down into the waters of His name, death, and life. He wants to take a trip with us out to Calvary to get rid of this old man that's doing us so much harm. He's, he gets on us and he says, go this way. And we say, uh-uh. 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 <laughs> We're not going to find life. We're going to find death over here out of that tree of death that grows out of the river of deceit down in the depths of our world. But if we get over here, and I can't win it like a horse. I had a cousin that could. But if we get over here and we start pawing in the, de- in, the, in the valley like the horse of faith does, and we say, yes, Lord, even though you have to cut it, even though you have to, you have to hit me, even though you have to do something to make me really understand it, Lord, I want to go over here where you are going, where you are leading, where you are making me follow, because I know that at the end there is going to be life and life in abundance. Because you, Lord, are not going to leave me 
with either the bad, the good or the better. You're taking me over there where I can find the best in a union with the Lord Jesus Christ. The living Word of God. The living Christ that's going to fill me up with light and with power and with real joy inside. Because the old man has passed away. The old man is gone the way of the, of the grave. And our biggest problem, our biggest, biggest problem is pride. And I was thinking about this to make tapes. I was in my prayer closet a long time back asking the Lord what He wanted to teach, what He wanted me to make lessons on. And He said to make a lesson on, on tape, on, on pride. This pride that we have within us. You say, I'm not proud. I'm a very humble person. I sweep the floor and I obey my parents and, I, and I'm obedient and I don't, I don't push anybody and I, I'm, real, I'm, real, I'm real humble. Well, now, let's find out if we're real humble or not. Because really, when, when we speak of pride in a crucified way, we're speaking about this old man and the very depths of our being, which is a, a, a wheel, a will within us that is filled with pride. Very quickly, let's go to Isaiah 14. And I'm not going into a lot of detail because there's a threefold nature book you can buy and read chapter after chapter on this. But just to explain it here very quickly so I can move along with what we have to see this morning, this afternoon, it says in verse 13, talking of Lucifer, Lucifer at the moment of his fall, it says, For thou hast said in thine heart, Where does our problem start? Where does it start? In our heart. Doesn't start with the devil. Doesn't start with a spirit out here that's tempting me. Doesn't start with a person that's pulling me. Or it starts in our heart. He said, And thou hast said in thine heart, Let's go, put your finger here. We'll be right back. I just want to pick up one more verse in Ezekiel 28. Let's see what happened to his heart. Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28 talks about Lucifer before his fall. Starting in verse 16 it says, By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee, the heart of thee, with violence, and thou hast sinned. And violence here means iniquity. Amen. Let's, let's get back up to verse 15. That's the one I wanted. It says, And thou wast perfect in all thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. And this iniquity sprout up inside of Lucifer. Not outside of him. Somebody didn't put it in him. He produced it inside. So in the very depths of his will, iniquity started running. And iniquity means perversion, means twisting of the truth, it means misrepresenting something, it means, it means lies, it means deceit, it means a twisting, even though it's a little tiny twist. It means to, to change the usual appearance of something. In other words, just a little tiny, just a little tiny change. That is iniquity. So what was in Lucifer's heart? When he fell, this iniquity. Amen. And out of iniquity then, he gave birth to a lot of other things. Yeah. Down in verse 17 it says, Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Yeah. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Yeah. So when this iniquity started flowing, this deceit and lies started flowing within Lucifer, then he gave birth to pride. Yes. And back in Isaiah 14, let's see what types of pride he gave birth to. Because this is going to help us understand why, where we can walk faster in the crucified way. Yes. Years ago, there, were, there, were, uh, there was a season of time when Sister Hicks gave a lot of keys that she called shortcuts to the bride. And I'm going to give you one of those keys tonight, so this, this afternoon, so you all can run quickly. If you will hear me, you will make the bride. You'll get rid of your old man like that. 
You'll get, you'll get, you'll get your widowhood very, very quickly if you listen to what I've got to say today and open your inner ears and your inner eyes and ask God to make you a hearer and a doer of the word Emmet that's going to restrain this man within you. Back in verse in chapter 14 of Isaiah 13, Isaiah 14, verse 13, it says, For thou hast said in thine heart, filled up with iniquity, I will ascend into heaven. Lucifer all of a sudden had a thought. All of a sudden he got a bright idea. All of a sudden he thought, I deserve more. God, you haven't given me the best. God, you, look, 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 all this that I have, I should have a higher position than this. All of my beauty, all of my wisdom, all of my music, all of my power as the great cherubim, all of my anointing by the Holy Ghost. I should have another position higher than where I am now. I deserve more. And this is the root of our problem. This is where the old man's got his, his, his roots deep, deep down within us. This is the taproot of our old man, of our old heart, of our old nature. This first pride of revelation. I deserve more. I deserve a better treatment. I deserve a better house. I deserve that they make way for me on the freeway. I deserve that my husband treat me better. I deserve that my wife fix me a better type of dinner. I deserve that my mother pay attention to me. I deserve that my kids treat me with reverence. I deserve that the person in the counter in front of me get out of my way so I can I can move on because I'm in a hurry. I deserve, I deserve, I deserve, I deserve. And after today, I hope every moment of the days ahead, you will start listening to this voice within you and you start realizing how many times a day you believe that you deserve more or that you deserve better or that you don't deserve such and such an evil treatment from somebody. And if you realize that, then all of a sudden you can lay the axe to that root. And John the Baptist said that Jesus was going to come to lay the axe to the root. To what root? To this pride of revelation that makes me think that I deserve more. This pride of revelation that makes me think that I know everything about everybody and about all situations. This pride of revelation that makes me think that nobody can tell me anything. And teenagers are famous for it. How many of you have teenagers? How many of them think that they know it all? Amen, amen, amen. Both hands. And if they could, both feet. <laughs> amen, amen. And how many of you parents that raised your hands think that you know it all? <laughs> that your poor kids don't know a thing because they haven't lived as long as you have. Your poor kids don't know a thing because they haven't had the knocks of life that you had. Your kids don't even know what life's all about. You know it all. (laughs) This is called pride of revelation. Pride of revelation. And we're all infected with it. We all were born with it. Even from little babies. They, They cry out because they deserve to have mommy come and change their diaper when they want. Yes. Right, mamas? Yes. Right, 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 right. Because they deserve for mama to be right there. Yes. And a lot of times mama's right there, and all mama does is feed their pride of revelation all right. by bowing down to their wishes and desires. I want that car. Yeah. I've seen them in the stores. I want that body. Okay, here it is. <laughs> Mother's pride of revelation, I deserve that this kid shut up because she's embarrassing me in the store. And the kid's pride of revelation, I deserve that dolly because I'm mama's favorite. Pride of revelation, pride of revelation, pride of revelation, pride of revelation. Amen? Amen. That's our old man. This is the one we've got to get rid of. And this is the, this is the root that we've really got to strike out against. And then, and then Lucifer said... I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne. He not only had a bright idea that he deserved more, he said, nobody's going to pay attention to me right now. I'm going to do it. I'm going to redeem this situation. And he gave birth to the pride of redemption. And he said, 
I am going to take my throne and I'm going to put my throne up here on high because I deserve to be up here on high. Amen? Amen. And what really happens with this pride of redemption is it's either fear or anger yes. that is born when we don't get our way, when we think that we deserve more. Amen. So during this week, how many of you have gotten mad at something? Hands up all over the place. Amen. That anger is a sign that you're already into the second pride, which is called the pride of redemption. And with your anger, you hoped to make that person be in subjection to you so you could be satisfied just like Lucifer was going to be satisfied when he put his throne up and he would be exalted just like God. He gave birth to a third pride, which is the pride of satisfaction. And so first we get this idea, I deserve more. And the people around me don't know that I know that I deserve more. So they're not going to give me what I'm thinking that I deserve. Okay? So what do I do? I get out my, my stick. I get out my... my my rod of anger and I say you come under me because I'm mad I'm angry don't you see that I deserve more <clears throat> and we scream and we fuss we slam the door we hopefully not cuss but I understand that Christians here and there every now and then say bad words but that's not this church here <laughs> And when that comes out, you can be sure that you have set yourself up on a throne and you're trying to make somebody else bow down to you. And if you don't set yourself up this way, then you're over here shaking. You're not paying attention. You're not going to give it to me. And you're over here with a lot of irritation and anxiety and impatience. And you're over here just shaking. And we think that by our impatience by our, our pushing or by our, our insistence that we're going to get our way. Because after all, everybody should know I deserve more. And I deserve that they come under, that they hear me, that they obey me. I deserve it. Amen? Amen. Amen. And we do that, and to a certain extent, we are satisfied. Because after we tell somebody off, doop, 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 how do we feel? <laughs> I really told him this time. <laughs> I really told him this time. My old man really showed off this time. And we are satisfied. For a while. And then the conviction of God comes down on us, sinner or saint, doesn't matter. And that anger then turns into a torment within us. It doesn't turn into life. It doesn't turn into joy and peace. It turns into a torment. And we're not satisfied until we make that person come and bow down and say, I'm sorry, I should have given you the peanut butter. Here it is. Please forgive me. And then we, then we feel satisfied again because we've got our will. And as long as that person doesn't bow down, then we're over here shaking and trembling because they didn't come. They haven't come yet. And we're worried. And what goes on inside of our mind? We're replaying the scene all over again. On the job, at school, with the husband or with the wife. I should have told him this. Oh, I really missed it there. If I would have told them that, they'd be back asking me forgiveness. They just don't really understand. We go down to sleep at night, and there it is, rolling and rolling and rolling and rolling and rolling. We have to take a pill to go to sleep. When we're asleep, we dream about really, really giving it to them. In a disguised form, we might be out on an elephant hunt and shoot the elephant, but the elephant's probably that person that we had a fight with. There's a lot, a lot, a lot that our mind does. But do you understand what I'm saying? Amen. We are proud people. Amen. We are proud people. I'm not talking about, about haughtiness. About, you know, here I come. I'm not talking about that type of pride. I'm talking about this daily pride that's pulling us down into the pits of despair, into the pits of anguish and fear and, 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 and tribulation inside and stormy waters inside day after day. All because we think we deserve more. All because we think that everybody has to revolve around us at every moment of every day and every time. Pay attention to what I say. 
pay attention to my opinions, pay attention to my ideas, and not only pay attention to them, come and obey them. And if they don't obey them, then I'm going to pull out my stick one way or another. Either with a silent treatment or with a loud treatment. But I'm going to cause a fight if they don't understand that I am boss. I rule here. You understand that? And you parents need to rule, but you need to rule without the torment inside, without the turbulence inside. You, you need to correct your children like God corrects us because the offense of the rule, not because they irritated you. When they irritate you, that means that you're up here on your pedestal and all your correction is going to do is make them get up on a pedestal over here and their pedestals are going to keep growing and anger and resentment all through their life. But if you get off your pedestal and you say, look, you did wrong because the rule was this. You did wrong because you're going to get hurt doing this. I'm going to punish you because you broke the rule. Not because you offended me or because you shamed me in the store. I'm going to, I'm going to punish you because you broke the rule. Then you're correcting. Then you, you're, 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 you're doing it. You're redeeming the situation in a certain sense, but not out of your old man and your old heart. Is this clear? Certain situations come up all the time in workplaces and in, in, um, in, in different situations of, of group settings where, where there's, there's absolute wrong. Let's say in a, in a church there's, there's a group of people that are absolutely doing wrong. And, and the, pastor, the pastor's temptation is to get up from the pulpit and pound them and, and whip them and, and rebuke them or, or not, maybe not that way but in a meeting then just wham, 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 wham and he's doing it out of anger. Out of anger, why? Because they are not paying attention to the fact that He is God in that church and they need to bow down to Him. And since they're not bowing down to Him, He's shaking and He's pounding so He can get His will in that church. You understand? What they're doing is wrong. They're, they're absolutely wrong. Let's say, that's, that's aside. God wants to show the pastor all of this that's going on inside of Him. Yes. And when the pastor or the leader of that group gets rid of his pride of revelation, gets rid of his pride of redemption, crucifies his pride of satisfaction, then he can stand up in front of that group and say, Brethren, you're doing wrong because of this and this and this. But there's going to be peace in his heart. There's going to be, there's going to be a calm inside of him. And he's going to be calling their attention to the wrong that they've been doing out of love and not out of anger, and they're going to listen. Amen. They're going to listen. Because God's pride, God's pride, excuse me, Lord, God's will of redemption is with love and mercy and peace and joy. Amen. So you, you do have a will to redeem in God, but if you're married to this guy over here, you can't have that one up there also. All right. Hallelujah. If you're married to this old man over here that's shaking and trembling and standing up on its pedestal because it deserves more, you can stand up and say, Jesus, I want to be joined to you. Jesus, I want to be joined to you. Jesus, I want to be joined to you. Lord, I want to be in your bride. Hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. And dance till the Lord comes. But there's not going to be a marriage union because you're joined to something else that's unlike the Lord Jesus Christ. You're joined to your own throne. You're joined to your own redemptive power. You're joined to your pride that's in the very center. And out of that pride comes death. A tree of death. And all the works of the flesh that's mentioned in Galatians. And God wants us to get rid of our pride so we can be joined to the King of humility. The Lord Jesus Christ in all of His stature. In all of His fullness. In all of His goodness. Maybe in another occasion... I can come and explain how to apply the blood, how to apply the, the water, and how to apply the fire. But meanwhile, use it. Use it. When this thing starts coming up, say, Lord, I'm sorry. This is a sin. This is coming out of pride within me. Every time you realize, I deserve more. And I'm going to pray that God will put it on you. Because I want you all to make it. I'm going to pray God will put it down on you. Because our time is short. And that in every occasion, he will say, look, listen what you said. Listen what you did. Listen what you, what you thought. 
I deserve more in this way or that way. And you quickly can lay the axe to the root of your problem and you can be in the pride, in the, in the bride very, very quickly. God wants us to make the bride. He's given us everything that we have need of, but He's not going to get joined to the pride within our souls and within our hearts.